I'm so pleased today to welcome Jared Isaacman. He is the CEO of Shift for Payments and the commander of Inspiration4, which is the first all-civilian mission to space. Thank you, Jared, for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. This is such an interesting mission, and it's so such a departure from space flights that we've seen before. So could you just tell us a little bit about Inspiration4? Sure. So this is uh, Inspiration4 is the first all-civilian mission to space. It's kind of that first step towards a world where you know anyone can go and explore among the stars. This is the first time in history that it isn't a you know global superpower like the United States or, or Russia or China or the European space agencies to actually put human beings into orbit. And what do you think it will be actually like to fly on Inspiration4? It's going to be on space, SpaceX's Crew Dragon. Um, so what are your sort of expectations for the launch? When is that tentatively scheduled for and uh, what are you actually, where are you going in space? Sure, so um, uh, we're scheduled to launch Inspiration4 later this year. So it'll be sometime in the early fourth quarter. And um, so this will be a multi-day orbital mission to outer space. So we'll be cruising around the earth at about 17,500 miles an hour. There will be some interesting elements uh, to the orbit because we're not going to the space station, which is kind of unique. No one's, pretty much every mission for the last 20 years to space has been going there. So we're going somewhere else which we think is important. It's actually a big step, stepping stone towards the missions to come, which will hopefully be to the moon and Mars and beyond. You know, space travel is not exactly known for its comfort, but you know, the Crew Dragon is this kind of plush version of a, a lot of crew capsules that we've seen before. I mean, what do you think the experience is gonna be like in the Dragon? Do you think you'll be like relatively comfortable considering you're off earth as comfortable as you can be? Yeah, I mean, whatever whatever the inconveniences uh, there are, it is a small price to pay for the opportunity to go to space on this, uh, you know, historic mission. Um, for sure, dragging amongst other spacecraft is is roomy. Uh, I think that's relative because when you look at something like the Soyuz spacecraft, like there's barely enough room to like put your spacesuit on. So uh, <laughs> you're going from like the most cramped, tight um, spacecraft possible to something that's just a little bit better. So it, it, it it's not like there's no living room or anything. I mean, you're probably talking about, um, you know, as much space as you would find like in, you know, the average like apartment bathroom, like in terms of mm -hmm. So it, it, it not a ton of room, but it'll be home for a few days. And then what do you think you're going to be eating? What's your space meal agenda, the menu up there? So it's a good question. The answer is like, we're going to have a chance to, you know, really expand the menu a little bit because when you take food up to the International Space Station, uh, there's a lot of consideration. What goes up there kind of stays up there for a really long time. So um, for example, someone brought pizza to the space station once and like the <laughs> yeast floated out of the pizza dough and it like stuck to the walls and it took like six months to clean it up and there was like mold. Uh, but we're only going up for three days. So, you know, it's that spacecraft's gonna come back, we can clean it. So I don't see any reason why we can't, you know, push the uh, push boundaries a little bit, maybe get some pizza, some comfort food up there. You just got to know whatever you bring up could be floating around. Chocolate pudding cake. Looks like it too. Not bad. Gonna be hard to eat. Gonna be messy. Hmm. Pretty good. Yeah, so obviously, uh... <laughs> You've mentioned there's a bathroom size capsule. Um, the infamous question, how will you guys be going to the bathroom? Is there one bathroom in there? Uh, how does that all work in the capsule? Yeah, so um, not a not a lot of comfort or privacy that you would find in the Dragon spacecraft. I mean, it is tiny. Uh, there is a little bit of a, like a privacy shield you can pull up and you basically are floating to the ceiling of the spacecraft, which is kind of nice that you get to use every bit of the square footage. Uh, and there is, a, there is a bathroom that is that is built into into the spacecraft system. But yeah, not a lot of privacy, but again, really small price to pay for an opportunity there. Yeah, no, it, so, it sounds like you're, you're a camping trip or something like that. You're just going to have to be very comfortable with your with your fellow mates in the in the ship. When it comes to just basic human necessities like catching some shut eye, um, how do you end up doing that in the capsule? Do you sleep in the chair um, and do you stay in your spacesuit when you do that? Yeah, so good questions. Um, so normally you would take your spacesuit flight off once you make it to orbit. So you're, you're kind of the riskiest parts of the mission would be on launch and recovery. And that's when you wear your space group. Once you're in orbit, you can kind of get comfortable, you know, get into like your, your sweatpants or something. 
And um, yeah, you just can sleep anywhere. I mean, like you can sleep on the ceiling. I mean, you're 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 in you know um, you know zero gravity. So I, there's a lot of flexibility. I don't know if I'm going to sleep in the uh, in the chair or not. I haven't given a given a whole lot of thought to it, but I'm probably going to. I think we're going to all try and really maximize the space. That's my guess. Yeah, and I can't imagine what kind of weird dreams you might be having in, in microgravity. So you're also a very accomplished pilot, and I just wanted to ask. Uh, how much of this space flight will be automated? And if it's quite a lot of it, will you ever feel like as a pilot who's a hands-on flyer, like a little frustrated that you want to like get onto the manual a bit, you know, how much is manual, how much is automated? Well, there's a lot of automation built into the Dragon spacecraft, um, which is great. I mean, this is the most technologically advanced, um, you know, space system in the world. Uh, it's the only human rated orbital class rocket in the United States. I mean, SpaceX is what, you know, um, like reinvigorated the world's interest in space. So no shock that there's tons of technology there. Um, but every automated system has a manual and backup system. So, you know, I probably have 6,000 hours flying all sorts of different types of jet aircraft, fighter aircraft, business jets, and they all have autopilots. But you still do a lot of training for the one time that that autopilot doesn't work well or there's an unexpected situation. And that's exactly how it'll be with Dragon spacecraft. Space flight is obviously an exciting thing. It's also a really dangerous thing. Um, how do you feel going into this? Is there any nerves or, or fear about uh, you know this this early technology? Um, how do you feel uh, approaching this this launch? Yeah, so I'm super confident. Like I I I, I think that when I you know compare space flight to you know, flying air shows where we were, you know, flying fighter jets 18 inches apart from other aircraft, that was, you know, way, way higher risk. Um, you know, I was in Antarctica about 18 months ago, climbing Mount Vincent, you know, if you get like appendicitis in Antarctica, like that's a big deal. Like there's no, no way to get home or get to a hospital easily, but you know, we can re-enter the earth's atmosphere in like an hour. Um, mm -hmm. so I, and I'm like hyper confident in everything that SpaceX has developed, like amazing technology. These are the people, by the way, that have given us that that great footage of rockets landing on ships and next to each other. So very, very confident there. The other thing I'd say is like, you know, there's a, there's a degree of, you know, people just being scared of, you know, the unknown because there's a, a lack of familiarity with it because not a lot of expo people have had exposure to it. So there's very few people have had the opportunity to go to space. Like imagine like, you know, 40 years ago, when you're talking to like a doctor who's like, I got this great idea. I'm going to cut open your eyeball and I'm going to shine a light in it and you're going to see better than ever. And you're like, uh, that person should be in like a mental hospital. That doesn't sound right. But then the next thing you know, there's like millions of people who've had LASIK and your buddies are like, oh, it's changed my life where everything's great. That's what space flight's going to be like. Like it might be 30 years from now, but it's like, oh yeah, those rockets, super reliable, no big deal. Lots of astronauts talk about this overview effect feeling, a uh, feeling of connection when they see the earth and there's no boundaries from space and all of that. Um, do you expect to have that kind of experience? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm trying to imagine what it's going to be like, but it's hard because that is just the view that so few have seen. Um, and I suspect that it impacts everybody a bit differently. You know, you, you have less than really 600 astronauts um, that have been fortunate enough to go up into, into orbital space and, and have that perspective. And I imagine, again, it really impacts every one of them a little bit differently. And can you tell me a little bit about the training that you guys will be going through uh, before the mission as in these coming months? Absolutely. So, um, you know, the FAA says that before we ever get strapped into the rocket, that we are uh, commercial astronauts. Um, and we're obviously starting as all civilians with none of us have been in space before. So we have to use uh, from now until uh, the end of the year to get ready. And we'll be following a, uh, a training curriculum that has been overseen by NASA when they human rated the Dragon spacecraft system, the Falcon system. Um, you know, that SpaceX, you know, has put together with, you know, a lot of, you know, oversight going on 60 years of lessons learned in space. Uh, and it involves a lot of simulator training. Um, that simulator training with us as a crew with mission control. Um, there is a lot of, um, you know, survival type training, whether it's at the pad, uh, the launch pad or in the water because we do splash down in the water. So it, it's pretty extensive, but um, mostly it's making sure that we can handle anything that's thrown our way that would have been unexpected. This is, I think, why the mission so is exciting is it's civilians, you know, obviously it's exciting that astronauts have, have broken so many boundaries, but for the rest of us, we're really hoping that we'll have the opportunity to 
be able to go to space in bigger numbers in the future. So do you see this sort of as the beginning of, you know, that sort of advent of really civilian space flight? No question. Like 100% agree with that. Like I, I totally believe I've, I've drank the Kool-Aid. I'm a huge SpaceX fan, obviously. I don't know if it's 50 years, 100 years from now. It, it will be like the Jetsons, like everybody will be jumping in and out of rockets and they'll go from point A to B in like minutes instead of hours. And there'll be a lunar colony and there'll be a Martian colony. Um, but if all those things are gonna happen, you know, two things as it relates to our mission, we really need to succeed. You know, one of which is we, we have to get our mission right for all those others to follow. Like if, if we don't execute really well, then it slips the timeline to the right for all the other missions to come. But I have no doubt like this is coming. I mean, if you if you just look to history, uh, you know, Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, that was one person and it was super expensive. And 12 years later, you had the first Pan Am transatlantic commercial service. Right. So it doesn't take very long for all these other great things to follow. I think it'll be the same way with our mission. You know, you kind of reference this, like, what's it going to be like in 50 years, 100 years? Although that's really difficult to predict, what are some of the big milestones that you're hoping happen in that kind of time frame? I, I mean, I think, you know, people, you know, see the videos on social media, uh, Starship, which is SpaceX, big, like, deep space exploration type, um, you know, spaceship. I, I think it's important to realize, like, what they are doing right now is on the scale or greater than, like, the Manhattan Project. Like it is huge, it is very costly, and so many things have to be right. Because it, their mission is not about putting two people on the moon, like, or I'm sorry, two people on Mars, like, like you know, the United States did, you know, um, during the Apollo program. They wanna put hundreds of people on Mars. That's what they're investing in right now. That is like super expensive, super ambitious. So um, yeah, uh, I'm, I, I have no doubt like we're, we're gonna get there.